kites. It's two, three. Uh, so uh, we'll start lessons from Erlang. Uh, the presentation is called Lessons from Erlang. Um, I'm supposing that uh, my dear listeners are not professional Erlang developers. Because if you are, you probably know more than me. This is a presentation for people who program uh, in various languages, uh, but would like to know what wisdom and uh, what good ideas come from Erlang. And um, if that's what you came for, then I think uh, you'll learn something. Um, so yeah, so when you're getting lessons, it's nice to know who you're getting these lessons from. So just uh, a few words about myself. I was born in 1983 in Poland, and that makes me older than Erlang. And it's funny because there are people programming in Erlang right now who are younger than Erlang, so I'm still on that side of the divide. Um, my uh, academic background was in Japanese, so I'm a recently converted software engineer. And so my viewpoint may be a bit different than those of, than those of you who know C since, you, since kindergarten. Um, I started with web development and that kind of stuff. And um, I was fortunate to be adopted by a band of roving Haskell maniacs. And, um, and since 2011, I've been working with functional programming. Uh, we did agile development, not the quotes agile, but uh, very uh, high uh, energy uh, close collaboration with the client type of development. Um, the technology was a bit of web, a bit of back-end services, lots of integration with SNMP and that kind of stuff for, uh, for an internet provider. So there was a rather wide spectrum of things we did in Haskell. Um, they were greenfield projects. Uh, we did some research. This is a quote research because it, we ended up just going through various papers and finding out different ways of uh, using the uh, wonderful benefits of functional programming and, and, and type theory to model uh, business logic and uh, business requirements. And so that's where I came from. And then since 2014, I've been working at Erlang Solutions in Kraków in Poland. And uh, the work there is different because, I mean, you don't often hear of someone maintaining a 20-year-old Haskell project, right? It's the, the time hasn't come yet for that kind of stuff. While with Erlang, this happens because it's an older technology so uh, there are many different customers. It's not greenfield projects where they say, OK, guys, so read your category theory and come up with a nice way to get and make our money. But this is more of we have a Erlang cluster. It's been running for x years. And we need some stuff done with it. So let's get cracking. So there are different uh, customer tech, um, methodologies. Uh, different people have different work styles. And the systems are much different. So Erlang systems. Um, a lot of work involves maintenance, uh, integration, bug fixes, and the projects are usually large. It's not microservices, and we switch Ruby for Haskell, and we go and, and, and be happy about that. But it's usually you know, hundreds of thousands of users, and time to tweak this or that. And so my experiences uh, with Erlang are kind of contrasted with uh, the previous work uh, with Haskell. Each of you may probably um, have different um, things to compare Erlang against, but uh, let's, uh, let's see what we've got. And since uh, geeks in the audience usually ask, I'm not related to this guy. That's Roger Zelazny, um, but no, no relation, probably. OK, that's out of the way. Uh, for non-geeks, uh, he's a science fiction-ish writer. Uh, was, yeah. OK. The design of Erlang and where Erlang comes from. Um, you know these uh, faces? These are the, this is the team, yes, Joe Armstrong. That's Björn and Decker. Uh, there were four people in this infamous or famous movie, Erlang the Movie, which is a promotional movie made by Ericsson in 1990, which was for internal use only. But as these things go, uh, it ended up uh, being a flagship Erlang promotional vehicle. Anyway, so the original Erlang uh, design requirements. Uh, I kind of talked about these uh, during my uh, workshop on Erlang. Um, so um, apologies to those who are going to listen to this again. Uh, the Erlang came, came out of the telecoms industry. And the design space in which, which constrained the authors had these specific requirements from the requirements team to the uh, engineering team about what uh, things, what kind of properties the systems 
built using Erlang should have. And by the way, the first versions of Erlang were run on Prolog. So the first ver Erlang virtual machine was essentially just an extension to Prolog, and it ran supposedly horridly slow. But despite that, and I think that's a very uh, um, uplifting thing, the, these people had the vision and they had the belief that maybe it's worth kind of suspending this belief for a while and trying to do something different uh, because we can see ahead of us that good things uh, await. And uh, kind of if you uh, listen to Bartosz's talk at, at the, uh, the opening keynote, the thing with these category theories and, and dependent type systems and all this, they get ridiculed by some people, but there is a big vision behind that which may come to fruition in some time, maybe not now. So anyway, these guys needed systems that were concurrent. Telephone switches, um, they needed to be soft real time. So more or less things had to happen after they were requested. Like uh, Alvaro said, uh, many of you came from across the hall. So, uh, we couldn't have one process in this concurrent system blocking the other ones out. The systems had to be distributed in the sense that uh, the, the, the work had to be distributed across different physical machines because we can't have half the country not being able to call the, an ambulance because one computer went down. So the, there was a design decision from the very beginning that we needed to ha ha be able to distribute um, the, the working system across hardware boundaries. Uh, hardware interaction, uh, yeah, so they needed to talk with hardware. This is less maybe of an issue for us working in the software at large industry, maybe embedded engineers have more to say about this. I, I don't have much experience with hardware interaction. They needed to do that because they were operating real hardware. Uh, large software systems, everyone does large software systems <laughs> at this point. Uh, complex functionality we all know and hate. Uh, continuous operation is something we do via uh, the cloud, load balancers and this kind of stuff. Here continuous operation had to be baked in to the system, to the, uh, to the language. Quality requirements, um, nothing much to say about that. It needs to be up 99.999% of the time. If not, then you're not getting paid or whatever. That, it, it these kind of fell out of the other uh, um, design requirements. And the last one, and I think the last one is the most important one here, fault tolerance. Um, some of this stuff is gonna overlap with what Alvaro said. I'm sorry, it's the same language we're talking about. The functional programming, the concurrency, the distribution, all this stuff actually is driven by the fault tolerance. They needed something that would just work all the time despite things that always happen. That is despite hardware errors, which will happen, despite human errors, which will happen, bugs will happen. Usually not trivial bugs, but the Heisen bug flavor, which manifests ever so rarely. And so taking all that into account, we needed to have a system that works. And so I've taken the liberty of cutting out the stuff that's kind of obvious for us today and, and leaving the stuff that's uh, special to Erlang and that's not, not yet solved at large currently. And these are the other two, um, yeah, Joe and Robert, uh, the other two uh, heroes of Erlang the movie. Okay, so. Um, so these four things, concurrency, distribution, continuous operation, and fault tolerance, for, to me, are the defining features of, of the Erlang design. And my question to you is, apart from distribution, because that's hard, but m leaving the other three, what kind of programming software construct implements these things uh, that you all know and use? Louder? <laughs> One more time? Okay, um, I'm gonna give you a hint. It's on every computer. A, a flavor of it is on every computer, a, a personal computer. It has concurrent processes. It's an built for... System. Yes, an operating system, right? You have seg segregated processes that run as concurrently as possible physically to achieve. It's meant for continuous operation, so if one program goes down, I don't want the other programs to be affected. In Windows, if, that, uh, <laughs> if, the, if the UI goes down, uh, what's it called? Explorer.exe, right? Then you're in trouble. And uh, fault tolerance is the exact same thing, right? If one program has a bug, then 
that should be okay for the for the operating system. And so it's nice to think of Erlang as a kind of operating system. This was, by the way, also uh, something that um, Joe Armstrong's um, PhD thesis from 2003 uh, goes in depth about a lot of these things. It's not one of those uh, very highly technical PhD theses that you're not supposed to read. It's, it's very uh, readable and I recommend it. Uh, he talks about the various uh, requirements and that they wanted to design something that would be kind of like an operating system because as a side effect they would be able to port it to different architectures, not necessarily being dependent on some specific implementation. That's why we have a virtual machine, that's why uh, it can be ported to various different embedded um, architectures. Okay. So the features of Erlang as an operating system. There's going to be four slides with code and no more. So if you don't know Erlang, it's not going to be very painful. If you've uh, uh, managed to uh, know a little bit, um, this is going to be obvious. So we have built-in concurrency. This is a module that implements this concurrency. It exports the function run. And it defines two functions, uh, churn, which just churns continuously without uh, producing anything ever. Um, and uh, this function will not blow any kind of stack because uh, Erlang optimizes tail calls, the Erlang VM optimizes ta tail calls, so it would just be running. And, and we spawn the function churn of zero arguments, and there we go. So our program continues to run, as you can see here. We run the function, and we get a PID, a process identifier. It is a process identifier, and it, and it just keeps on running. And we can spawn any number of these until um, system limits uh, tell us to stop. That would be either hard-coded, I mean hard limits like uh, the amount of RAM or something we can define for the virtual machine. But that's an implementation detail. The idea is that it's a basic thing in Erlang to spawn a process. It, it, it doesn't require any special um, preparation. It doesn't require creating any kind of special resource in the operating system. These are so-called uh, green threads, as in the Erlang uh, virtual machine knows how to schedule work between uh, these uh, running processes. Um, it is a preemptive scheduler. Usually you can run a scheduler per core on your, on your physical machine. So um, this churning process will not block out your process that converts movies to GIFs or something. It will all keep on running more or less equal. There are, as with everything in real life, there are places where this breaks down. For example, you can implement functions in C and call out to them in Erlang, and then various bad things can happen. But also performance happens, so it's a trade-off. Okay, but concurrency is the first thing that Erlang offers, and it's cheap and fun concurrency. Uh, next is process isolation. Uh, this is a module called isolation that implements and shows how this property works. We have a crashing function that divides by zero, thereby preventing any kind of sensible recovery. and uh, we spawn this function and, and uh, return OK after that. And as you can see, we return OK. So the process that, r that launched the function isolation run survived. Nothing affected it, although the thing that was spawned is long gone. That was crashed, cleaned up by the GC, and it's gone. So we can, we can uh, have confidence. The whole system promotes the kind of thinking that you code the thing that needs to be done. You look for the work that needs to be done and you implement the worker, which I'll say more about in a sec. Um, and the, these two fundamental building blocks allow that. So you have concurrency, that means you can cheaply create these workers. You don't need to rack your head, oh, how big is my pool? Can I, can I manage this? What kind of processor am I running on? No, you just create them and you let them run and you let them crash. And this is um, what Erlang kind of nudges you to do. Uh, and processes communicate by passing messages. I, I'm not an expert on OSs, but I believe there's things like Dbus and this kind of stuff that lets processes inside an operating system. We, we have pipes, named pipes, whatever, right? That, you can, uh, that processes can talk to each other. Here we have the bang. We have a function echo, which takes a parent's PID, and it returns to the parent a function saying, hey, this is an echo from my PID self, which is my PID. And we spawn this child 
the parent spawns this child with its PID, thereby providing the address to which the child will respond. And the corresponding, um, I don't know if you've read um, CSP by Tony Hoare, that he defines these two nice symmetric name, bang, and name, question mark. Here, it's not as symmetric. We have a receive, and receive goes through the processes queue and finds out, checks whether the messages that are in their match are clauses. This is a very simplistic example. We don't check for anything. If we don't receive something like this, then we'll just hang there forever. But please don't think about that now. We spawn the echo process. The echo process returns this. And when we run it, we get the echo process's PID. Incidentally, the, 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 the echo process is now dead. It sent the message and it's gone. It doesn't have any kind of uh, recursion built in, so we will not hear any more from it. And so we have these three things. Isolation, well, concurrency is the basis. We have process isolation. And we have message passing. And thanks to these three things, we can achieve, more or less, the ninth uh, design requirement, which is fault tolerance. Why? Because when the process crashes, it can send a message, or the VM in the name of this process can send a message to anyone who's listening, and thereby letting us detect and propagate errors. Uh, Alvaro showed us how processes are linked. I don't really like the semantics of linking because you need to tell, you need to flick a switch in the VM telling, telling the VM that you are now a, not a, a trap exit type of process. I think uh, monitors are cleaner because they only go one way. That means I spawn a function and I wait for any kind of error notifications that will get sent if the function crashes. And sure enough, we get a very nice Erlang. This is, this is kind of like Lispy, a Lispy uh, gestalt, where the things that go, the, the messages that get passed around in the Erlang VM are Erlang terms. So if you want to do something based on this, you can. This is not an opaque, you know, uh, something that's only available to the system or an implementation of detail. This is a regular message like I could send with a bang pattern. Um, this is why, incidentally, there are these references to ensure that the process you monitored is the process that you got the down message from and not someone spoofing. So this is the anti-spoof protection. Uh, right. And so um, maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not. This is how you can create supervisor trees, supervision trees. Uh, some processes just listen. Some pro well, some processes spawn a bunch of children and listen. And if they receive messages that something went wrong, then based on how you define that crazy tuple with multiple little entries, you can uh, exercise a different strategy for restarting, not restarting, telling wh whoever started me that I give up because I can, can't do any more. But essentially, this is it. It's concurrency, isolation, and message passing. If you add error detection, if you, if you add the capability of dying processes to send something, then uh, you're good. So you have Erlang as an operating system. There's one more slide with code, actually. It is the distribution. This is a very uh, pleasurable thing in Erlang. Uh, the left side is a terminal, is a screen, a terminal session, and the right side is the terminal session. Uh, we start a Yang node, and we start a Yin node on the same computer. We ping one node from the other. And now, when we run the command nodes, we get a list of connected nodes. As you can see, the Ying machine sees the Yang machine, and vice versa. And what does this give us? This gives us all the goodies I just talked about, but across physical virtual machine, virtual machine boundaries, whether they be physical on separate um, physical hosts or on the same host. It doesn't matter. You have two Erlang machines running on Yang the active element, <laughs> we spawn something on the passive element, it gets run there and crashes there, we get the PID, so if it were still alive, we can still talk to it, even though it's over there, but since it crashes, we get an error report sent over the wire about what crashed running on the other computer. So fault tolerance is just as, okay, if we ignore network failures, which happen, but in an ideal world without network failures, the fault tolerance is just as, is just as strong uh, in clusters. And um, 
Yeah, so this is Erlang as an operating system. Any questions up to this point? Okay. Um, I don't know how the other, how the other um, concurrent paradigms stack up to this. I've read a little bit about um, Cloud Haskell. I don't know if anyone has experience with Cloud Haskell. It's not as easy. You need to be more strict about things. You need to be more strict about uh, processes. I don't know how Akka does these things. Anyone, anyone here have experience with Akka? And how does uh, the concurrency work on JVM? It's the Java green threads, or is it operating system threads? Uh, with Akka, yes. Um, Akka is on top of Scala. Uh -huh. green ah, OK. I see. I see. Yeah. yeah? What is it about the Erlang threads that allows it to be green? <laughs> OK, the Erlang, okay, the Erlang uh, mm, virtual machine is called the Beam virtual machine, and uh, it it uh, operates on a bytecode, and this bytecode is just statements, like an assembler. Bam, 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 bam. And so the, um, oh wait, that's preemptive scheduling. And you want, you want to know about green? Well, well this, is, this kind of ties in. Yes. In, is, well, um, implementation-wise, I can't tell you. You could hit up Lucas Larson from uh, the OTP team who uh, is working on the actual uh, virtual machine. But the, the fact that uh, you use preemptive scheduling allows you not to worry about what happens with these uh, processes. Because they, get, they have a number of reductions, that is a number of, state of these assembly statements that you can execute. If you execute your poll, then you get switched out and someone else comes in. <coughs> okay, uh, so the next section is that Erlang is a practical system and uh, I was kind of, this is my defense of Erlang against uh, the strictly type purists uh, because from a strictly type Haskell perspective, Erlang is hacky. Uh, there, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things you can work around. I remember a friend who was learning Erlang said that, yeah, I, I le uh, learning Haskell. He said, yeah, first I, I want to learn functional programming, so I went to Erlang, but you can cheat. <laughs> And yes, you can cheat a lot, but Erlang is battle-tested. There are systems out there that have been running for years and that are um, physical proof that these concepts, the design concepts that Erlang was based on work uh, in this domain, which is the domain of networking, routing things, not doing heavy um, calculations because, as you probably know, Erlang is not, not the best um, vehicle for that kind of thing, but for long-lasting, uh, chatty servers. Uh, Erlang is battle-tested. You have RabbitMQ, you have React, you have the various chat servers. Um, our office does Mongoose IM, you have eJabberD. There's a bunch of code at Ericsson. Uh, there are s switches in the Arctic that run on two physical connected uh, computers and a heater. <laughs> And uh, they run some ancient versions of Erlang, but no one touches that because it works. So, yeah, that, if that's not battle tested, then I don't know what is, right? Um, next, it's opinionated. And now the modern uh, kind of framework based thinking sometimes sees this as a good thing, sometimes this is a bad thing. Um, the, the reality is that you sometimes can't do the things you can do with other functional languages because Erlang is not really about being a universal functional programming language. So it's usually easier to go with what Erlang nudges you to do. So if Erlang says, you know, do this and that, and then put a receive clause or make a selective receive, and then clean up, it's, it's often you see Erlang programmers just internalizing <laughs> these things and say, okay, so we'll just use that and that, and they write the same code again and again and again because that's the way people have been doing it for 20 years. Uh, and again, this works. So it's a uh, kind of ambivalent thing. It's inconsistent and it's quirky. Uh, I'll have a slide about this. You need to remember a lot of things when you code in Erlang. You need to remember the APIs or have the manuals open because sometimes you need to pass an atom here or you need to go through the supervisor 
specification and the child specification, find out which parameter is about what, and all this stuff. So it's, it's not a cleanly, beautifully designed API. I think this kind of comes out of the, out of the battle testedness of this, that there was a problem, someone needed to fix this problem, probably fast, so they added something. The, the core language of Erlang is pure and, and very consistent, but the wider, the, the, the bigger the circle you draw around the core Erlang language, the more you'll find libraries that were implemented for some Arctic project and left lying around, but they have to be in there because if someone upgrades, then it has to work with the old stuff. Okay, there's historical baggage, which is basically this. But the total, the total, I, I mean, uh, many of these things don't really seem uh, positive, like positive things. And this is why I mean practical system in, in opposition to a theoretical system. This is not, of course, there, were, there was theory put into how this is going to work, but uh, I don't know if you know the anecdote, it's if you search for it. When the, I believe it was Robert Verding, said, oh yeah, someone told us about the actor model, but that was 10 years after we designed Erlang and we never really, we never really knew there was something like that. We just had these constraints and we needed to fit a system in that space. And that's the system that fell out of that. Same thing with, uh, immutable state, same thing with functional programming, same thing with uh, um, tail call elimination. You need to have a process running. How do you make a lightweight process? Well, you just call the same function and, and close the stack, right? And so yeah, so all these things kind of come out and, uh, and, the, and the resulting language is, is a wise language. It's old and it's wise and there's a lot of things you can learn from it and there is a sense of, uh, of uh, <laughs> in that this language is used to do really cool stuff and uh, there is a lot to learn from it. And so uh, the lessons, right? The talk was supposed to be about lessons, so uh, time for something completely different. Uh, we're just going to go through the, the basic things and, thi and this part, actually most of the talk is personal because again, I only can learn my own lessons, you guys can learn your own lessons. Um, so we're going to have uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, the good are the things that I believe uh, are huge wins and are, huge, uh, are hugely beneficial for the developer, uh, probably for the customer as well. But from my perspective as developer with working with real systems, this stuff is awesome. Uh, we're going to go through each of these. Apart from distribution, you saw how distribution works with the, that kind of primitives, what you can build but the other things I'm going to talk about. Essentially, if, if I can just touch on distribution quickly, if you have one computer and it's not handling the load, you just distribute it, you find the kernel of things that need to be synchronized, you abstract that, that needs to be somewhere between the nodes are replicated, but all the other things, since the system is shared nothing by default, you don't need a load balancer to balance the load because you can, you know, distribute things. Um, if you're accepting incoming requests, you probably need a load balancer. But uh, Rabbit load balances things across queues internally by, by uh, way of Erlang mechanisms. <coughs> the bad things that you should not try to replicate when you're designing your next cool programming language are Erlang records, Erlang cruft, um, flat namespaces, and awkward higher order programming. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that. And the ugly, which are things, you know how they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. They're not bad, but they are aesthetically um, iffy to me. And that is uh, the type system and related tooling. The programming experience, after you've been exposed to these very new, th I don't know if you work with Clojure or that kind of stuff, the, the general um, user, the UX of programming is very good in recent languages. Well, here we're stuck in the 80s and the 80s that don't really like Unix too. So there's a lot of stuff everywhere. There's visual clutter. Uh, there are error messages flying for good things and for bad things. And uh, uh, as I said before, this is probably because if you go to the Arctic station and want to get the logs from the last year, you probably want to see the good things as well. So there's, the, again, there's, uh, most of these things make sense. Uh, the comment culture and conventions, uh, I, I, as far as I know, people want to write self-documenting code. 
But if you read Joe Armstrong's doctoral thesis, he says, write a lot of comments and make these big blocky comments. And in Emacs, and in the Emacs mode, if you say, Erlang, start a new server or whatever, you get about 10 lines of comments to one line of code, explaining this stuff over and over and over again. Um, and there are the testing libraries are wonky. They're nice, they're, they're powerful, but they're strange. And the macros and parse transforms are as strange as they sound. OK, the good. Maybe I should have gone the other way from the ugly things to the awesome things, but let's, let's get the awesome things first. So OTP. Uh, OTP stands for Open Telecom Platform. And this is a library that was added, well, it was uh, organically grown on top of the core Erlang system in uh, the early 90s. And Joe Armstrong was, was I believe, the, the leader of this team. And OTP uh, gives you a set of predefined behavioral patterns for consistent design. Uh, so if you have a, uh, various developers writing, for example, let's, let's take the example of I have process one, and I want to call the API of process two. How am I going to do it? Can we just have a brainstorm? I want to say I have a process, uh, I don't know, a client connection, and I want to read from the database. I want to read cat picture one from the database. So what, how would you see this as, as a process-based communication? Anyone? I'm, process, I'm the client process. I know, the, I know the PID of the database. I say, database, bang, give me the cat picture number one. Right? And then what? And then I wait for the response. OK, but the database doesn't know my client ID, right, my process ID. So apart from send me the cat picture number one, I need to say, send me the cat picture number one, I am process ID self. And I send that. And then I wait. But what happens if I'm running concurrently and I need to send a couple of these requests and I don't know which one is res in, comes in response to what? So then I would probably have to say, OK, I'm going to make a unique reference here to prevent spoofing. And I'm going to send you that request. This is the cat picture. This is my unique request. And you will send this back with the response. And this is my PID. Now give me the cat picture. But what happens if the message gets lost on the way? Right? So, OK, so, so then you need to say, I'm going to do that, but then I'm going to have a timeout. So in case the message gets lost, I know what to do. Right. But what happens if the process dies while it's implementing this logic? Right. So I probably need to have to monitor that process and also match for the down message, and so forth and so forth. So there are a lot of things that you're going to need to do anyway if you want to have some kind of guarantees within your system. And this is what OTP does for you. Say you want a client-server architecture, bam. You run your gen server, delete all the comments that get generated by Emacs, and, and you have that. That's something you can, you can make a call, and this is a, either a a synchronous call, or you can wait for the response. You can provide a timeout. You can do something when you when the thing times out. You have a finite state machine. If you're into that kind of stuff, by all means, uh, you have event handlers and event servers. So it's easy to say, have some kind of logging. This is, by the way, how the standard Erlang logging is implemented. There are events and various things like shell listeners. We'll listen to that. And you have the supervisors, which are uh, a different uh, topic coming up soon. And so OTP, apart from these behaviors, which must not always be typed with O-U-R, they can be typed B-O-R. It will still work because their language is international. Um, apart from the behaviors and this kind of stuff, this uh, not only uh, relieves you of the pain of uh, implementing all these things, no way. OK, so it'll be only the good things, because there won't be time for the bad things. Good. So OTP um, gives you these guarantees and also allows you to share work across teams of programmers. Because if Alvaro writes a gen server, I'm pretty sure I know how it works. Um, and then also it's a me methodology for managing software in the large and consistent operations and maintenance. So an application is a thing. It's not like I have to think of where do I put ETC do I keep it in JSON, and what, how do I distribute it? What's the binary going to look like? An application is a fixed structure. There are fixed ways of configuring it. There are fixed ways of configuring dependencies, set, configuring dependencies, and whatnot. So if you just stick with what's given by OTP, you're interoperable ac across the, the ecosystem. And releases. Releases are a package that you drop and you run, and you can also do hot code load on releases 
which uh, is a type of black magic no one does these days, but I guess they did it back in the 90s. Okay, supervision trees. This was, uh, this was uh, touched upon uh, a second ago, but uh, just, just as a rehash, the red guys are supervisors. The supervisors don't do anything. If you want something done, you program a worker that does it. And you, d and you don't program the worker to recover from crashes or to implement logic about restarting or whatnot. You don't even have to implement reporting errors from the worker because the OTP system guarantees that things will propagate up. So for example, if you have uh, some kind of sockets reading data, you're probably not going to catch every kind of protocol syntax error that, you can, that the client can create. So why not why, why catch anything, right? Let's just try to parse it as it goes. If it fails, then the error message will get logged and the supervisor will know that I failed. Um, let's say we have database connections. Some elephant steps on the network cable and <coughs> all of them go down for a sec. Then depending on the strategy we have, we can either say, okay, maybe we should take down all the connections for a sec and then put them back up. Or maybe we just put, take, one the, take the one that was stepped on and if the other ones run, then that's fine. Uh, if they get restarted too many times because the cable was yanked out, then the supervisor itself can say, okay, I give up. The part of, of the work tree that I'm supposed to handle is just not working, so, so handle me. And so this way you have an organic type of system where uh, it's like a kind of amoeba where it moves around and if it touches and if it doesn't, then if, if something hurts it, then it moves away, but then it can move that way slowly again, right? Un unless you chop it off. Uh, and then this, say you have some kind of bug which appears once in 10 years in the worker. I don't know if it's in the worker logic or maybe in the client logic. Then, okay, then once in 10 years, this part of the supervision tree will flicker out for a second and then come back up. And you can leave that running in the Arctic, right? So you don't have to care about this kind of thing. And on the other hand, if the error propagation of the supervisor goes all the way up to your application, then that means your application is not able to function. And so we just quit. Uh, I mean, we can't recover from that. So this is awesome. <coughs> and uh, rephrasing Alvaro again, you can have the actor model, but the supervision tree and the kind of emergent behavior it gives your systems is the, the biggest winning point of Erlang and OTP. So yeah, program for the correct case only, let it crash, subsystems will organically return to their initial stable state. And the system has a good chance of fight functioning despite highs and bugs and failures, as we discussed. Okay, if there's one more thing I can talk about, it's going to be introspection and debugging. The Erlang system has awesome debugging, well, tracing capabilities. Because if you look at the function bytecode, if you don't have tracing enabled, then the entry point just points straight to the instructions. If you have tracing enabled, then there's a special instruction that matches trace patterns, which are kind of like declarative things about what I want to trace. So you don't only trace function calls, you can trace the exact type and value of arguments that gets called. So if I know that this function crashes when, the, when it has a parameter set above 100, I can trace only those calls. So this is amazing because you log into a live system and you just do it uh, in production. You can sometimes crash production when you produce too much uh, output. That's why they are, these are dangerous. But these capabilities are built into the, into the VM and people have made amazing tools around them. Uh, one of them is Recon, which allows you, I don't know if this is legible enough, but it says, okay, I want trace calls to Q, to any function in the Q module where the first argument, A, is either a list or is an integer bigger than one. And bam, you get the calls coming out of there. And you, and you also say, I want 10 calls in 100 milliseconds. If there's more, then stop reporting them because you'll flood my screen. And you get that. This is no, this, there is no D-trace involved, no instrumentation. You just get that right out of the box. E-flame is another thing. I don't know if you know these flame graphs. Th this is not time. This is uh, samples. And these are particular uh, function calls. And the thing that's on top is the current stacked frame. And so here you have a blocking call that has nothing on top of it because it's waiting for something. You don't need, you don't need uh, D-trace or system tap because the Erlang VM provides you with the information to make this. So this is also an amazing thing. Um, and that's not all, not only tracing, you have regular functions that return things that are Erlang data structures that you can work with. So you have process info that gives you 
various bookkeeping info about your process. You have sysget status, which returns stuff from OTP compliant processes, like their internal state. It's not really an internal state. It's an immutable data structure that gets passed to uh, subsequent uh, tail recursive calls, but it's called state. Uh, there's Erlang statistics about stuff like VM time. You can get memory. Uh, you can, your system will know, for example, if it's running out of memory and can select different strategies. You, you can really know a lot about the virtual machine. And I have five minutes, so hot code reload is magic. You compile a module and you say reload this module, and anything that's using functions from this module will now use the new functions. Uh, so yeah. Okay, uh, so five minutes. I'm not going to go uh, any deeper into these things. We finished the good parts, and uh, I'll be taking questions now. Yep. Um, if you're using OTP uh, processes, then you need to implement a thing called code change. And it's a function that takes the old version number, the state that was in the old version, and some other bookkeeping info. And it's your uh, choice to implement some transformation of the state to keep it compatible with the new old version, new version state. Maybe it's something like this. So you have enough information to, to um, keep up with the hot code reload. No one really does this, though. This is mostly used for emergencies. I had a system in production where there was about 300,000 users logged in, and we needed to change the process that was handling the connections. And we recompiled it, and we <laughs> reloaded it, and that was it. And it took you know, less than a second. So, so for these cr critical emergencies, this is awesome. For, for, as a deployment strategy, it's a, it's a horror. Because you don't know what version of the, of the release you are running at this point, right? If you just deploy one module. But the OTP system has this thing called release and rel up files where you can script precisely the way you want to release and maybe roll back with release. And this is the black magic that I was talking about because this is, this is a DSL that's written in Erlang tuples and it's complex. And no one knows really how to make it work nicely. <laughs> it's complex. It's, you know. Most people just use a load balancer and, you know, <laughs> flip the nodes one by one. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much.